of a sin and unholiness were immersed in it. But don't let that lead you away from the source of truth. My job as a priest to tell you, keep away from false aberrations. Keep away from the errors of the fundamentalists. Do not read anything about the rapture, the millennium, the thousand-year reign. Do not read the Schofield Reference Bible. Do not read any Seventh-day Adventist literature. Do not read any Hal Lindsey books, such as the late great planet Earth, Satan is alive and well and living on Earth, or what have you. Do not read the Left Behind books. Do not go to the Left Behind movies. Do not listen to dispensational preachers or other TV and radio preachers. And if you have any of this kind of stuff at home, use it in your wood stove. If you don't have a wood stove, throw it in the garbage. That's where it belongs. Number two, obviously the end of the world is an exciting and a frightening topic to say the least. But before anybody gets excited, remember we always have to keep in mind God knows everything. He knows from all eternity exactly when he was going to have every person live. He knows exactly what he's doing, and no matter when he chose to have someone live, he gives that person all the graces they need to become a saint at that exact time in the history of the world. We need to remember that the most important thing is not when in history we live, but how we die. The most important thing, the very most important thing, is to die in the state of grace. Okay, that's the one thing that finally really matters. Third point, the church teaches that prophecy is only completely understood in its fulfillment. What does that mean? It means that in general, all the parts of the prophecy are not completely clear until after the events have come to pass, and then men can look back and say, oh yeah, that makes total sense. But given that God gives us prophecy to help guide us, and nowadays there are so many confusing and wrong ideas floating about, especially about the end time prophecies, how is it that we're supposed to stay on the right track? Look, our Lord knew we'd have problems and confusion, so he established a teaching church and sent down the Holy Spirit to guide it, as he promised, to the end of the world. And God, who disposes all things sweetly, has periodically raised up extraordinary teachers to guide us. There are 33 of them in total. These teachers are renowned for their holiness of life, the importance and orthodoxy of their writings, and they've been officially recognized as a church as doctors. That means that they're officially approved teachers of the faith. So they're safe guides to lead us through these thorny theological thickets. Thickets like the end time prophecies. So to stay inside the boundaries, besides a brief introduction taken from the work of the great Dr. St. Augustine, today we'll rely almost completely on the work of one doctor. A great Jesuit with a photographic memory, St. Robert Bellarmine, who summarized the teachings of the fathers and doctors with respect especially to one extremely foreboding aspect of the end times. He wrote a whole book about that menacing man, the man of sin, the Antichrist. We'll rely on that work today, but believe me, we're only going to skim over the surface of what Cardinal Bellarmine wrote about. Now all that is by way of introduction. According to the teachings of the fathers, just as a week has six days followed by a day of rest, so also the history of the world has six ages followed by the eternal heavenly rest of the saints. In his work on the catechizing of the uninstructed, St. Augustine gives a brief summary of the teaching of the fathers with respect to these six ages of the world. As he points out, the first age of the world went from Adam until Noah. The second age of the world began at the ending of the great flood until Abraham, who was, as St. Augustine notes, the father of all nations which follow his example of faith, but from his own flesh, he was the father of the Jews. 
for the one people among all the nations that worship the true God. The third age of the world extends from Abraham to King David. The fourth age of the world from King David to the Babylonian captivity. The fifth age of the world from the Babylonian captivity to the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with the coming of our Lord, we're now in the sixth and final age of the world, which will last until our Lord's second coming on the last day, Judgment Day. So again, the history of the world in a nutshell. The first age, Adam to the flood. The second age, the flood to Abraham. The third age, Abraham to King David. The fourth age, King David to the Babylonian captivity. The fifth age, the Babylonian captivity to Christ's coming. The sixth age, first Christmas to last judgment. And then that's the end of time. Now the sixth age of the world has two basic divisions. And understand them, we have to keep firmly in mind that before Christ our Lord came, only the Jews had the true religion. Only the Jews worshipped the true God. Only the Jews had the true priesthood. Only the Jews had the sacrifice demanded by God. Only the Jews had the true temple, which was in Jerusalem, okay? Only the Jews knew the true God, and only the Jews worshipped the true God. And only the Jews knew the true faith, no one else. So if no one else knew the true God, who were our ancestors worshiping for those of us that are not descended from the Jews? The inspired word of God gives the answer in Psalm 95, 5, where it states, all the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Now the prophets pointed out that during the first part of the sixth age of the world, the messianic age in which we live, the pagan nations would give up this devil worship and come to worship the true God. The pagan nations would give up their paganism and become Catholic. But then during the second part of the sixth stage of the world, according to prophecy, the Gentiles will reject the true God and turn back to paganism. So there's two basic divisions in the sixth stage of the world, the coming in of the Gentiles and the going out of the Gentiles. Now, before we get into any more details, we might wonder where we are in the sixth stage of the world. Are we in the first part with the pagan nations leaving idolatry and worshiping the true God? Or are we in the second part with the Gentile nations leaving the worship of the true God, that is, rejecting Catholicism, and turning back to paganism? To ask this question is to answer it. Another word for the second part of the sixth age of the world is the end times. What are the signs of the end times? St. Robert Bellarmine gives six absolutely certain signs besides the coming of the Antichrist himself. Two of these signs precede the Antichrist, two accompany him, and two follow upon his rule. First we'll look at this list, and then we'll take a closer look at these signs as well as the man of sin. The six signs, according to St. Robert Bellarmine. The two signs which precede the Antichrist, the gospel must be preached in the whole world. The Roman Empire's power must be terminated. The two signs which accompany the Antichrist, the preaching of Enoch and Elias, or Elijah, the savage persecution, and the ending of all public mass. The two signs which follow upon the rule of the Antichrist, the destruction of the Antichrist, and the end of the world. Now let's begin by taking a closer look at the sign. Two signs which precede the Antichrist. The first sign that gospel must be preached in the whole world. We'll just note in passing what Christ the Lord said and move past that. Matthew 24:14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. Second of the signs that precede the Antichrist. The Roman Empire must be terminated. What is that supposed to mean? Hasn't the Roman Empire been gone for about a zillion years? Well, this is a perfect example of why we need tradition. This is a certain conclusion based in Holy Scripture but we can only understand it from tradition. 
First, we'll look at where the idea of the termination of Roman power comes from. Then we'll take a look at what precisely it means insofar as we can see that. Cardinal Bellarmine here is summarizing the teaching of the fathers with respect to Daniel's the book of prophet Daniel chapter 2 and 7, the Apocalypse chapter 17, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're not going to go into any detail for the sake of time. We'll take a look at that mysterious passage referring to the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I will read a shortened version. Quote, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you be not easily terrified, as if the Lord, day of the Lord were at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for there must first come a revolt for the man of sin to be revealed, the son of perdition. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity already worketh, only he who now holdeth do hold until he be taken out of the way. Close quote the Holy Spirit. There must first come a revolt for the man of sin to be revealed. You know what withholdeth. He who now holdeth do hold to be taken out of the way. What does that mean? There's actually two aspects to this, one religious and one political. The revolt that must come first is the religious aspect. It's also known as the great apostasy, which is the massive turning away of Gentile peoples from the true faith, abandoning Catholicism, and turning back to paganism. That's the religious aspect of what St. Paul is saying here. The political aspect is this mysterious something which is withholding the advent of the Antichrist. What is it? The fathers tell us it's the power of the Roman Empire which is blocking the coming. So what does that mean? It would be a topic of sermons, or sermons just to cover this one topic, so we'll take a look at three points from the fathers, and we'll tie them together. First, just in passing, we note in the book of the prophet Daniel, Daniel sees a vision in chapter 7, and in it he sees a beast with ten horns, and then there's a little horn that rises up. You can read more about that at home. First point, St. Jerome, doctor of the church, comments on this vision. Quote, We must say what has been handed down to us by all ecclesiastical writers, that in the end of the world, when the Roman Empire is to be destroyed, there will be ten kings to divide the Roman territory between them, and an eleventh will rise up, a small king, who will subdue three of the ten, and thereupon receive the submission of the other seven. Close quote, St. Jerome. The small king is the Antichrist. So the first point is that all the fathers state at the end of the world there will be ten kings of that Roman territory, and the Antichrist will rise up and destroy the Roman Empire. Second point. St. Hippolytus of Rome explicitly states that the ten states which will appear, all other kingdoms and ruled by kings, shall also be democracies. Third point. Cardinal Bellarmine quotes Lactantius, who explains exactly what the final destruction of the Roman Empire means. Quote, The Roman power which now rules the world, and my mind shudders with fright to say, but I am speaking of things in the future, shall be taken from the earth, and the power to rule shall return to Asia, and once again the Orient shall dominate, and the West shall serve. Close quote. Let's tie all these points together. What are the fathers saying here? They're saying that the Antichrist is being restrained from seizing power by the Roman Empire, which has to be understood prophetically as being the remaining areas of the empire which remain under Western rule. The Roman Empire will last until the great apostasy, a rejection of the true faith by the Gentile nations. During this time, there will be ten kings ruling ten democracies in what used to be the Roman Empire, and then an eleventh king will rise up, subdue three of those ten kings, and other seven will submit to him. The power of the Roman Empire will disappear once the West is subject to the East, and the power shifts over to Asia. We will soon see that the Fathers located the precise location in Asia to which this dominion will be shifted. That's the gist of this prophecy, which basically leaves us in a more luminous darkness. 
Remember that prophecy is only understood completely in its fulfillment. Those are the two signs which precede the Antichrist. Next week, we'll begin examining the two signs that will accompany him and so forth. But before we do that, we'll take an extremely brief look at the, what St. Robert has summarized about the man of sin, the Antichrist. St. Robert says the Antichrist is one man, according to Scripture and all the fathers. He states that there are two most certain facts about him. He is principally coming for the Jews and will be received by them as the Messiah. Secondly, he will be born of Jewish stock and circumcised and observe the Sabbath at least for a time. As our Lord stated to the Jews, You have rejected me, but another will come in his own name, and him you will not reject. St. Robert also points out a fearful symmetry. Just as Christ first came to the Jews, to whom he was promised, and by whom he was expected, and then later he joined the Gentiles to himself, so also the Antichrist will first come to the Jews, by whom he is expected, and then later, one after another, he will subject all the Gentile nations to himself. See, Robert points out that the Antichrist is not the devil incarnate. Only God can take on another nature. The devil has an angelic nature, so he can't become incarnate. He can only possess a man. St. Robert says, quote, He will be the most perfect instrument of the devil, so that in him is the bodily expression of all possible diabolical malice, just as in Christ our Lord was the bodily expression of all divine goodness. Close quote, St. Robert. In the terms of his name, we all know that the number of his name is 666. St. Robert quotes St. Irenaeus, the father of the church, at great length on this point. St. Irenaeus was taught by St. Polycarp, and St. Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle. In sum, his name is a secret kept by God until the Antichrist arrives, since he isn't worthy to have his name pre-announced by heaven. St. John the Apostle explicitly warned that no one should attempt to guess this name from the number. Why? Because those who do this will be easily deceived by him when he arrives under his own name, since they will not be on their guard against him. As to the seat of the Antichrist, where will he rule? St. Paul wrote that the Antichrist would take his seat in the temple of God, claiming himself to be God. What is meant here? St. Robert Bellarmine gives two possibilities. First, Rome. As that great doctor, St. Jerome, states, quote, He shall sit in the temple of God, either Jerusalem, as some think, or in the church, as is more truly thought. Close quote. For that Cominius, who stated, quote, He did not sit in the temple of Jerusalem, but the church of Christ. Close quote. Other choice. Jerusalem. St. Robert states, quote, Nevertheless, the true opinion is that the Antichrist shall rule from Jerusalem, not from Rome, from the temple of Solomon and the throne of David, not the temple of St. Peter and the apostolic see. Close quote St. Robert. St. Robert supports his argument using both scripture and tradition, showing that this is by far the more common teaching of the fathers, even showing that elsewhere St. Jerome has written of Antichrist being in Jerusalem. He adds an interesting detail to that discussion of Lactantius we've already seen. Remember that during the time of the Antichrist, the supreme rule will pass over to Asia and the Orient will dominate while the West is in servitude. St. Robert completes this thought, showing that Lactantius clearly states which part of Asia this king shall rule. And that's Syria. Now remember, this is the ancient Latin terminology. He even tells the part of Syria that this man will rule from. Judea. St. Robert also discusses the doctrines of the Antichrist. He points out there are four major principles here. First, he will deny that Jesus is the Christ. Therefore, he will attack everything our Savior instituted, such as baptism, confirmation, the priesthood, etc. He shall teach that the Jewish laws, such as circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, and those ancient ceremonies have not ceased, but still have force. Second, he will assert himself to be the true Christ promised in the law and prophets. Another will come in his own name. 
Third, he will promise him, proclaim himself to be God, and he will wish to be worshipped as God. Finally, he will proclaim that not only is he God, but he's also the only God, and he will attack all other gods, both the true God and all false gods, even idols. Okay, next week we'll finish our brief look at the man of sin, and we'll pick up where we left off with the six absolutely certain signs of the end of the world. Let's review. We've seen the history of the world can be broken into six ages. The first age, Adam to the flood. Second age, flood to Abraham. Third age, Abraham to King David. Fourth age, King David to Babylonian captivity. Fifth age, Babylonian King Christmas. Sixth age, from Christmas, the first Christmas, to the second coming, and it's the end of time. We've seen there's two basic divisions in the sixth age of the world. The Gentiles coming into the Catholic Church, the Gentiles going back out of the Catholic Church. We've seen there six absolutely certain signs of the end of the world. Two signs which precede the Antichrist. The gospel must be preached to the whole world, and the power of the Roman Empire must be terminated. The two signs which will accompany that will be preaching, and there will be a savage persecution and the ending of all public mass. Two signs which follow upon the rule of Antichrist, his destruction and end of the world. We took a brief look at the meaning of the end of the Roman Empire and saw it meant that until the end of the world, the Antichrist will be stained from seizing power by the presence of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire will last in some sense until the great apostasy, which is a rejection of the true faith by the Gentile nations. During this time, there will be ten kings ruling ten democracies in what used to be the Roman Empire. An eleventh king will rise up, subdue three of the ten kings, and the other seven will submit to him. The power of the Roman Empire will disappear once the West is subject to the East, and the power will shift to Asia, specifically to Jerusalem. We've taken a closer look at this foreboding man, the son of perdition. He'll be Jewish, and observe the Jewish laws at least for a while. He will not be the devil incarnate, but he will be possessed in the most perfect bodily instrument of Satan. Although the number of his name is 666, we are explicitly forbidden from guessing who he might be using this number in order to avoid winding up as one of his followers. He will rule the world from Jerusalem. He will deny that Jesus is the Christ and institute Jewish laws. He will proclaim himself to be Christ and God, to demand to be worshipped as such, and will attack all other gods, even the true God. Why am I preaching on all this? In the first place, it's the end of the liturgical year, and so the church, your infinite wisdom, has placed this topic before us. It's part of our faith, so it's my duty to teach it to you. We're not studying this to be sensational. We live in a time when there's so much radical nonsense and this very notion spewing out of every kind of media outlet that we have to look at it in slightly more depth than we might otherwise do. During the offertory today, place yourself on the host and in the wine and make a special intention to grow in holiness and to keep the holy faith in the time of this apostasy.